feed it back to them, paraphrase it, how they feel about it, till they say that's right. You then begin to move forward at light speed as soon as the other side feels heard. So many problems are eliminated. So many barriers come down. So much cooperation happens as a result of that. You are listening to the Property Developer Podcast, your home for tips, ideas, and inspiration to help take your developing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Justin Getty. Hello, and welcome to episode 33 of the show. Thanks for joining me. I trust you are well and your projects are progressing along. I have a sensational episode for you about negotiating. And my guest is a former FBI hostage negotiator who has written an amazing book to help you get better deals. This really is a fantastic conversation that I'm sure you will love. Just before we get to that, here is an update of what I've been up to. So my 20 townhouse project is all done and settled. And last week, our latest project went to a local council meeting for the councillors to vote on whether to issue us a permit. The planning officers for the council had recommended that we be given a permit for 16 units, three less than what we asked for. However, the councillors ignored this recommendation and voted against issuing us a permit. This was a very disappointing outcome, as we put forward a very strong scheme that was quite conservative next to the planning controls in the area. Yet, due to the level of objections from the local residents, the councillors ignored their own planning rules and voted us down. So, we are now forced to go to the planning tribunal for a review of the decision, which will take more time and cost more money. It seems ridiculous, but that's developing for you. I think it is only going to get harder to get planning permits for bigger developments, and they will take longer to be issued. Anyway, I will keep you posted on how that progresses. So, on to something far more exciting, my discussion with former FBI hostage negotiator Chris Voss. Chris has written a book called Never Split the Difference, a fantastic resource that I highly recommend you buy and read. It is filled with practical ways to negotiate better deals and is coupled with incredible hostage stories and real-life examples of how to apply the ideas in the book. And they really do work, as I've been road testing them over the past few weeks, which will be covered in the conversation Chris and I have. And there is one amazing line you can use to resurrect dormant opportunities Keep an ear out for that one. The book really is worth getting and easily sits in my top 10 business books. Chris and I are working on a training program for property developers to help them become gun negotiators. So if you are interested in participating, please email me, which is justin at propertydeveloperpodcast.com and let me know what you'd want to get out of it and situations where you could do with some help. For me, it's things like dealing with selling agents, navigating through the planning process, dealing with lenders and handling buyers. So all the key areas where as a developer, you need to be an effective negotiator. Just think about the money you could save and the deals you could pull off if you were a top class negotiator. And if you aren't getting better at negotiating, then your competitors certainly will be and your counterparts will continue getting the better of you. In this discussion with Chris, we cover some incredible tips on dealing with selling agents, the biggest mistake most people make when negotiating, and how no is a very powerful way of framing discussions. This is a fascinating conversation, so get your pen and paper ready, and let's hear what hostage negotiator Chris Voss has to share about negotiation. As usual, I started off by asking Chris what food he could eat until he was sick. Ha! Steak! Yeah, yeah. I eat, I eat a lot of steak. I'm a I'm a I'm a meat eater. I'm a I'm a velociraptor. <laughs> any any particular way you like your steak? Uh you know, medium, a uh, little somewhere between medium, medium, uh, medium well. Yeah. Yeah. Depends upon the steak. Depends upon the rub. Got to get a good rub on your steak. Got to get somebody to rub your steak good, right? <laughs> <laughs> Are we still talking about eating, Chris? Of course we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no entendre intended. <laughs> and have you got any particular sides that you like having with your steak? Well, you know, these days, I'm trying to lean more towards the, uh, you know, the ketogenic diet, the bulletproof diet, you know, which is primarily, uh, you know, it's a lot of protein, animal protein, and the right veggies. You got to eat the right veggies. So it would probably be Brussels sprouts or asparagus. Oh, my wife has just gone into a Brussels sprouts phase. 
Oh, you got to, and that that doesn't make you happy? Uh, it's not too bad. If it's done with a bit of onion and a little bit of bacon, it, it's actually quite good. There you go. Exactly right. You got to put some more of <laughs> that stuff in there. And bacon makes everything better. Even bacon <laughs> even makes ice cream better. Well, uh, that's absolutely true. And I've often thought about running a podcast dedicated to all things bacon. <laughs> 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 anyway, let's let's move on. Now we're here today to talk about negotiation, and you're probably one of the world's preeminent practitioners uh, on negotiation. Can you share a bit of background with us? Because it's pretty fascinating about how you got to be where you are today. You know, and and I'd like to say also, um, I know coach is an overused word, but I've coached a lot more negotiations. I, I think I'm a darn good coach, and. If I could, I'd, I'd draw also an analogy, um, which was going to be an American sports analogy, but Americans do that at much to the uh, chagrin of the rest of the planet because we're always talking about sports. But, you know, there's a famous NBA basketball coach named Phil Jackson. He may be the, the best uh, in the history of the National Basketball Association. As a matter of fact, all the top coaches are pretty much the same. They were only fair players. They were only pretty good players. And I like to think, uh, I think I'm a pretty darn good negotiator, but I think I'm a better negotiation coach. And I've coached more negotiations. You know, I can, I can help people get better. So I, I went off track on uh, what you asked. <laughs> I apologize for that. That's so okay. focus me back in as to where you wanted me to go with that. Oh, just a little bit about your, back, your background. It's pretty fascinating. You worked for the FBI. You did hostage negotiation. It's not, yeah. it's not what you'd call a standard career path. Yeah, uh, got into law enforcement, local police officer, FBI agent, worked terrorism, SWAT, uh, became a hostage negotiator. Ended up in charge of the hostage negotiation team for FBI New York City, and then got promoted up to where we were running the overall program, and they put me in charge of uh, international kidnapping response. So, you know, just talk to all sorts of people from... Iowa to, I never negotiated in Antarctica. I'll give you that. That's what it is. That's a continent. I, the one continent I haven't been on to negotiate yet. <laughs> well, it's, at least let's hope it stays that way. Or, you know, it could be an interesting story. Could be very interesting. Wasn't there a book there written, was, written like that? Ice Station? Yeah, uh, could, could be. Yeah. You know what? If they had a bar there, most of my stories involve bars. A lot of them do. So if they had a bar there, I'd end up in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a bit of a cliched scene from uh, most movies that involve law enforcement people, isn't it? They end up drinking in bars. Well, uh, or they, you know, it's from. I, it's hard to find a movie where somebody's not drinking in a bar, right? No, that's true. And you've outlined a lot of your experience and some great stories in your book, Never Split the Difference. Yeah. Um, thanks. And you know, the other, one of the things that I really like about that book too is every story. It starts with a hostage negotiation story. We follow right on with a business negotiation story, personal life story, using the exact same skills so that, uh, you know, you, you, if you read it, you get the sense that you can do it. It's not terribly complicated. It's really flexible. It works. And one of the adva- another advantage is, since it's based on hostage negotiation skills, what a lot of people don't realize is that the hostage negotiation teams all over, use, all over the world use the same skills. Guys and guys who work for the London Met are using the same skills that we used in New York City, that they use in Tokyo, Japan, that they use in Cape Town, South Africa. So the stuff works because we're human beings, um, not because of the, our ethnicity and not because of necessarily the circumstances, you know, where it, because it works on people. Yeah, well, I've got a copy here that's uh, quite dog-eared with lots of pages that have turned over and highlights on them of uh, fantastic lines and yeah, it, look, it really does work. I've, um, I've used some of the lines in it over the last couple of weeks. Excellent. Which have, good, uh, good. Which have, which have had some good results. All right, all right, yeah. And we, we might dig into that, at, uh, into that shortly. But you've also had a, quite a career beyond law enforcement and hostage negotiation because you've ended up being somewhat of an academic as well. I'm willing to admit that, as embarrassing as that is, you know, the old academic uh, academic title. But, 
Yeah, you know, I'm lucky enough to teach at Harvard, um, taught at the law school negotiation, was on a teaching staff there, taught international business negotiation there, in another part of Harvard, taught at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., taught at University of Southern California in Los Angeles in the, in the business schools, teaching business negotiation in the business schools. And it's been, it's been pretty fun. You, you, you run across people at that level who just want to learn. And if you want to learn, this stuff is a lot of fun. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a really practical book, and I think it's your book will definitely stay in my top ten business books for a, a very Thank very you. long time. So, if, if Thank you. people are listening and they haven't bought it, they should definitely go out there and and get it because it's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think it's pretty easy to absorb too. It's very easy to absorb, um, and it made its it paid its money back uh, within the first two weeks, Chris, from when I bought it. You made a deal that was worth over nineteen dollars. Yeah, Excellent. Yes. <laughs> My wife and I went to buy some new dining chairs, and I used some of the techniques in the book to get a discount off the chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, uh, yeah. nicely done. Yeah, I said to my wife, that book just paid itself off already. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? What did you say? Did you, did you go with the classic how I'm supposed to do that or what did you do? Uh, uh, did we did a deadline. I, I said to my wife, tell her that your husband won't let you pay that amount of money and we've got to go and get the kids from school and she needs to tell us right now whether we can get whatever it was, 20 or 30 bucks off each chair. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Yeah, no, well, that's a key thing, too. You don't really say no. You just say you can't do it, which is a completely – the other side reacts completely differently to that when you say you can't do something. They want to help. They want to jump in. They want to make it work. Yeah, nicely done. Yeah, and I've uh, also used your technique of uh, asking people whether they've given up on something. Oh, man, that's killer. Oh, that is killer. I, I was shocked at the, uh, the results that that line has got. It, it that one is one of the craziest jolting things in a positive way that may be the single most effective positive jolt line that we have yeah it's unbelievable I'll, can i i'll share a story with you about it cuz i was i've been trying to get a guest on this podcast for probably 9 months and yeah I, and i lost contact with them for about five months they just were refusing to respond to my emails and then I sent them that one line email have you given up being a guest on the show and within five minutes the guy had written back saying no 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 we haven't we're still interested wow, wow. <laughs> that's cool right yeah really cool I hope he's not listening <laughs> <laughs> well it's all right I mean you know what you use your powers for good and not evil you're trying to help somebody out you're trying to make a good deal yep that's, that's a good thing because, yeah, this stuff really is sort of, when you wrap your mind around it, it's kind of insanely influential. So you can, you can do a lot with it. Hopefully you're doing good stuff and you are. Well, it's, uh, it's very early days. I actually could have used you on my team over the last couple of weeks because I've had some negotiations that didn't go my way. So that's fair. Uh, Take care. Take every deal. No, that's right. Actually, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you was around – how you handle things when a negotiation fails? Yeah, well, uh, the only the only time I these days the only time I feel a negotiations failed is if we haven't really gotten anything from the other side where they where they started to collaborate. You know, a lot of people early on are going to try and cut your throat really quick, and if they can't cut your throat quick, if they can't low ball you, if they can't high anchor real fast. Um, then they move on. And I, I want to at least know what I could have gotten out of them. And so if, if, I don't, if I don't get them out of that, if I, can't, if I can't break them out of that and get them involved and get them collaborating, to me, that's the only way that I've failed. Now, there's been plenty of discussions we've had where you know, we've gotten into them a little bit and based on the conversation, I don't like what I see and we're not going to move forward or I don't like them because I can't trust them. And then we don't move forward. But, um, you know, for me, a negotiation failing is failing to get any sort of collaboration at all out of the other side. And most people you can get some collaboration out of in some way. You can move, you can add some space into it. And that really isn't that far from, you know, the rules for success in hostage negotiation because 
bad guy sets a deadline, I want something now or I want some at a certain time. If we take them one minute longer than what they originally planned, then we're already winning. You know, uh, you, you win your battles a little at a time, you know, by inches, if you will. And then, then if you if you play the game like that, then pretty soon that stuff starts to accumulate, and you make a lot of good deals. Okay. So, what about when the deal just doesn't happen despite all your negotiation, and the, the ink doesn't go on the paper to complete the negotiations and get the deal done? Yeah, you know, uh, I, if if we've if we've given it a uh, a, a try, um, and we've had, you know, we've had conversations that we didn't get past square one on it, or you know, maybe we got to square three, and they sh we should have made a deal, but we didn't. You know, that's to me, that's all right. I, I believe that uh, a bad deal is far worse than no agreement. You know, we say no deal is better than a bad deal, and so I'm happy not to make the deal. If I smell there's a bad deal in the offing and I just avoided the bad deal because, you know, some people, they're going to they're going to suck the life out of you in implementation. They're going to be difficult to deal with or the time is just not going to make it worth it. So I, I don't I don't have I don't have an issue with that in, in a private sector. There are always there's always a better deal to be had with somebody else. So if the other side, you know, if they if they only you we were in conversation with the largest Internet service providers on the planet not that long ago and they wanted our stuff for next to nothing and felt that we should be privileged to do business with them and we just stopped trying you know that we just they were never gonna the the people that were had the decision making on the deal were not gonna have to live with the consequences of whether or not they made the deal because they were actually already all getting ready to be promoted they didn't really care about this interaction and we just stopped communicating with them. It just it wasn't worth the aggravation. And they, they weren't going to bring the dollars to the table. So I'm fine with that. And then in your former professional life with the FBI, I mean, failed negotiations sometimes resulted in people losing their life. How did you deal with that? Well, um, it's basically, it, it ain't easy. You know, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like it's easy. There's two kind of failed negotiations in, in hostage negotiation. There's the train that you see coming at you. And then there's the train that hits you when you're not looking. You know, most of the time you can see the train. If the train's coming at you, if you see you're going to get hit by a train, most of the time you can see it coming. And then it's an issue is how much collateral damage can I save here? Because there's always collateral damage and hostage takings. You know, there's always family members. Um, but, you know, the, there's po post-traumatic stress rates on victims of kidnappings are as high as they are on the victim. The victim families are as high as they are on the victims themselves. So the collateral damage, the loved ones of people who have been taken hostage, you know, those, you can mitigate those problems even if you know the train's coming which, and there have been phases like that in, in the Middle East at different times in, 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 in Iraq and close to Iraq these days, Syria, where you see that train coming. Now, then there's, there's, there are times when you don't see the train coming. Um, for whatever reason, people have died and, and you didn't expect it to happen. That's hard. And that some people, hostage negotiators tend to either, if that happens to them, they say, I, you know, I don't need this. I could do something else. And I think that's fine. I think they, they can move on. Or if it happens to you, you say, you know what? I got to double down. I got to get better. I have to raise a level of my game. And that was the way I reacted. And the way the negotiators I like to have around me also, because you're not going to, you know, something's going to go bad sometime. Now, are you, are you going to double down and get better? Or are you going to quit? Either, either decision is okay. You just got to make that decision. Yeah, well, there's a, a great saying that good habits are developed in bad times. Ah, there you go. I think that that's probably a very good saying. And so I don't want to go over everything that's in the book because I actually think people should go out and buy it and do, them, do themselves a, uh, a service by reading your book. But what are some of the key points ab about negotiating that people should be aware of? Well, you know, uh, 
the first one really is let the other side go first and try and uh, make it, it's going to sound cliche but it's a Stephen Covey advice from way back when called seek first seek first to understand then be understood like if you want to be heard the fastest way to being heard is to hear the other side out first because they want to be heard and they're not going to listen to you until they are I, you know, I had a, f- a friend of mine not that long ago said, yeah, I took a negotiation course and he told us the number one rule was to make sure you got your point across. And I, th- and I said to him, all right, so that sa- makes sense if you talk about it, but let's imagine what that, how that plays out. You got two people determined to get their point across. Nobody's listening. So you're each wasting the other guy's time. You know, the delay that saves fa- time is to, some, you know, let the other side feel heard. Get get what uh, that's right out of them. You know, feed it back to them, paraphrase it, how they feel about it, till they say that's right. I mean, you then begin to move forward at light speed as soon as the other side feels heard. So many problems are eliminated. So many barriers come down. So much cooperation ha- happens as a result of that. It's a real simple thing, and just so many people are so determined they have to have their say that it never happens. And if you can just do that, 75% of your difficult situations will immediately work themselves out, 5%, easily. Imagine how much life, how much easier your life would be if 75% of your problems went away, and and they do. You know, why why? Then that leaves the 25% remaining. You don't even have to win that many of those (laughs) for your life to take a big step forward. Yeah, well, in the recent negotiations, I was doing, um, I was trying to get the other side to say that's right, but I just couldn't pull it off and I knew it wasn't going to go my way. Yeah, well, it can be hard sometimes because... You know, you really, this whole empathy thing is trickier than a lot of people realize. There's nothing in in that concept that requires what you say to be the truth. You know, the other side might have just a vastly distorted view of the situation. Empathy is based on the other person's perspective, which by definition then doesn't include either truth or reality. And a lot of people have a real problem with that, especially if you know the other guy's in the wrong. Like, okay, I could use empathy, but only if I'm right. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. That ain't, that ain't, that ain't the way this works. So, yeah, it can, be, it can be pretty tough in contentious negotiations. And I know that's a point that you made in your book around, uh, I think you called it tactical empathy, where you can tactical em- empathy. empathize with your counterpart, but that doesn't mean that you sympathize with them. Right, and a lot of, that's a fine line that might as well be as important as a Great Wall of China. You have to get that clear in your head or you will not be affected with empathy. You just won't. Yeah, which I thought was an interesting point because I think it would be quite easy for people to think, for someone like you, negotiating with what would be described as very bad people would be very challenging it's challenging until you until you come to see the power of it. And then then when you see how powerful it is and you know if you can walk that narrow path, it gives you an opportunity to have an influence literally with any human being on a planet. And once you wrap your mind around around that, it goes from being challenging to being incredibly empowering. And and it is. You, you, I get to the point if I exercise empathy, I say to myself, you can use this with anybody and that's kind of cool I, I, I like that yeah because I think it's an easy trap for people to fall into where they just think the other person they're dealing with is in the, they're an idiot or mm-hmm. they're a real hard ass and that it just automatically makes their mindset more opposed to finding a way through yeah you know you want to pound the other side you want to you want to find them wrong uh, and we, then we take the light in finding the other side wrong, which then becomes sort of a counterproductive uh, reward system because you're happy if you find them wrong, but you are never going to make a deal. 
you know, win the argument, lose the deal. Win the argument, lose the relationship. What are you really after here? I, I don't know that you're really after losing the deal or the relationship, but it's a matter of getting out of your own way in order to make it work. And one of the interesting ideas that you articulate in your book is, is this concept about, around framing things around no. Could you uh, elaborate on that or share some thoughts about that with us? Yeah, when we discovered that collectively, you know, with the people that I was working with, and that's that, that whole thing that you talked about before, shooting out that message that says, have you given up on this, whatever it is. I mean, it's triggering the no. It's kind of, it's kind of a double, it hits emotional intelligence in two ways. First of all, when people say no, they feel protected. And if you feel like you've just protected yourself, you have a tendency to relax and listen and dial in a little bit. You know, it's a classic, your teenage kid says, dad or mom, can I? And before they finish the sentence, you say no. But when my son was in his seventeen, seven, in his teens, and seventeen or so, and and he said, "Dad, can I?" and I go, "No." And then I, but then I'd hesitate and I'd wait for a few minutes, and and then I go, "All right, so what was it that you wanted?" Because I already said no, right? So I'm in a no lose position. I'm protected. I can hear him out. I'm not hearing him out as if I'm being convinced. I already said no. And, and I think that's how we teach kids persistence. I'm convinced worldwide that's why we don't understand that we've taught our children persistence because they get us to say no, we say no, and they cope, keep going. And because we feel protected, we let them talk us into stuff. <laughs> you know, we're willing to listen. That's how we taught them not to give up. So you, you trigger a no, use it, you do it as an adult. And the have you given up on that not only triggers the no protection feeling in the other side, but the second thing it does is it triggers loss of avoidance. And as human beings, we are hardwired. This is Nobel Prize winning uh, behavioral economics. Danny Kahneman and his partner Amos Tversky came up with prospect theory, which means we'll go out of our way to avoid losses. We'll go farther out of our way to avoid a loss, then we will go to accomplish a gain, farther out of our way to avoid a loss and to accomplish a gain. And have you given up on is giving somebody an opportunity to make a move to avoid a loss and they're more likely to do that. So all bundled into this no thing is just a bunch of really um, stealth psychological strategies that are just dead on, they work phenomenally. I know they do because I've used them the last couple of weeks and I've been quite surprised because it feels counterintuitive to do it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I saw a phrase one time, learn to do the counterintuitive things that will save your life. And that's definitely one of them. Mm, yep. So I would encourage people to, uh, to try that, use some of the techniques in the book because they really do work. And then the other one I wanted to talk to you about was repeating so getting pe repeating back what people say to you well and uh repeating back what people say to you <laughs> yes repeating back what they say to you chris <laughs> yeah you know what you didn't want to you didn't want to bite on that one didn't you you felt you felt the hook and you tried to resist i know you did <laughs> initially you wanted to respond that you felt yourself being tugged only because you know we you know you know to watch out for that. We'll come to silence shortly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a mirror thing. It's a negotiator's mirror. The you know the hostage negotiator's mirror technique is repeating, you know, selected one to three words of what someone has just said. It's the mirror, and it's not the mirroring where you m reflect their body language or if they, you know, if they lean, they put their hand to their chin, you put your hand to your chin. If they lean to the right, you know, you lean to the right. That's not that kind of mirroring. This is the last one to three words or selected one to three words. And there's something about that also that really cuts across type. It cuts across ethnicity. People want to respond. Again, my son Brandon, uh, my director of operations, you know, he, he, th he describes them as thought connectors. And the other thing that's really good about that is, is we typically use that in place of what do you mean by? And there are a lot of people that when you say, what do you mean by? They're going to repeat what they just, just said exactly because they thought their words were chosen perfectly. And it must inherently be the best way to phrase it. 
but also when you repeat it back the same words that someone has just said, you're also telling them on another level, you heard the words. They don't need to repeat those words. You need more. You need to fill in the blanks. And it's a great, there's no doubt in the other person's mind that you heard those words. So they don't have to repeat them again. They need to expand on them. They need to connect. They need to go into more depth. So that's another, you know, very simple skill that has a great deal of complexity in how it hits the different portions of the brain and triggers good positive responses. Yeah, and it was something that I used the other day when I was talking to someone, and it's not something I often do, but I used it and it did um, unearth some fresh information or just got the pers- the other person to elaborate a bit further on the point they were making. Yeah, yeah, Which- yeah, very good. Unearthing, using it to unearth information is a great phrase. Yeah, so it just yielded a little bit more information that, uh, that I could then sort of stow away for, for future use. Well done. And what about labeling? Can you share a little bit about labeling with us? You know, well, the thing I love about labeling is when we first started uh, adapting hostage negotiation for, for business, I wasn't even sure that labels had applicability. Like I was, I was, I, I knew that there was a great overlap in open-ended questions. We now call them calibrated questions. And we've limited that list to what, how, and so, what we say, sometimes why, and discarded the rest of the questions. But, you know, I didn't think labeling was that important. A hostage negotiator refers to it as motion labeling. And, and a hostage, and it's usually, it seems like it sounds like you're angry. You sound angry. It seems like the situation's made you upset. Those are two examples of labels where you label a dynamic or an affect. And hostage negotiators would focus mostly on emotions. And, and so that's why we call it labels instead of emotion labels for business, because you could label anything. You know, um, I was in a conversation with the guy who became my book agent, and I just said, you seem guarded, because I was, it was his, his affect. I was labeling his affect. We've had uh, a bunch of people make great deals just before they thought the deal was going to go bad when they've said, it, it sounds like there's nothing I can say to get you to change your mind. I mean, that has triggered great deals to be made. And what really triggered it open for us was we were in a course where we divide people into default types. We believe there's three types, fight, flight, make friends, your caveman response. And the world pretty much divides evenly into those types. And we were talking to the types. We asked each type, what skills do you want to have used on you? And labels and mirrors were the only two skills that all three types really, really, really like. And one in particular, the analytical type, a label might be the only way to get them to open up. And that was one of the analytical types. We said the question was, how do we get you back to the table? Because once driven from a table, then an analytical type is nearly impossible to bring back to the table. And uh, the individual said, I, you know, uh, maybe a label? And a light bulb went on over our heads. And we're like, Wow. This, without question, has turned out to be the single most powerful skill of all the nine skills that we teach. The labels get through. They have more flexibility to get through to more people. You can tee more things up. You know, it's it's as simple. It sounds like there's nothing I could do to get you to change your mind. Makes deals. Um, It sounds like you really want to get this right. Makes deals. And that's just a label. Uh, it's an, it's a it's designed to trigger contemplation in the other side in a very specific way. And when you do that, again, barriers drop, information flows, things change. All right. And the next one, which I'm setting myself up for, I know, but silence. <laughs> so you want me to just sit here and not say anything for a while until <laughs> you speak? Is that it? <laughs> Well, this is a, uh, an audio format, Chris, so extended periods of silence could be awkward for all of us. Right, right. Well, you know, and the advantage that we have with the audio format, too, is that, like, people can't see right now that you're sitting there wearing a Batman costume. I mean, <laughs> nobody knows 
that you actually conduct these interviews wearing Batman costumes. So, well, that, and I would tell you, it's very impressive. Well, it's only on the upper half, Chris. You can't see below the desk. <laughs> A Superman costume down below, is that it, right? <laughs> so you're Batman and Superman at the yeah, same I like, time. I like to have the most superpowers I possibly can. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, well, so, you know, uh, so silence, that, that's another crazy one. Some people are horrified at silence. Some people cannot shut up to save their lives. Actually, two out of, two out of three of these default types that I was talking about earlier, silence, they're very uncomfortable with it for very different ways. You know, the, the very assertive, control-oriented guy feels out of control if they're not talking. And they're scared to death to be out of control. Those types are actually very easy to deal with because as soon as they feel like they're in control, they drop their guard and they're very easy to get, get them to agree with you if they feel like they're in charge. Hey, you're in charge. And they love that. The other type that has a problem with silence is the very relationship-oriented people. They signal their anger with silence. You know, give somebody the silent treatment. That's how they signal anger. So they're horrified if they go silent that the other side is going to feel they're mad or when the other side goes silent on them, they think, oh, my God, they're mad because this is what I do when I'm mad. You know, it's a problem of projection bias. One of the reasons why the golden rule is wrong. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Well, if you never want to have silence and you're talking to somebody that needs silence to think. You can imagine a tight mismatch there. One guy saying to himself, oh, my God, I just need some time to think. And the other person saying, oh, my God, they're angry. <laughs> Those are two completely different inter interpretations over silence. And if you're, if you're one of those who feels out of control when you're not talking, well, I'll go silence because now you are going to talk, 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 talk until you talk yourself into my deal. And when you do that, I, eventually I'm going to say, holy cow, what was it that you just said? I love that idea. And you'll be really proud of yourself and think you came up with something when, in fact, I just waited till you came up with something I liked. And then I agreed to it. So, yeah, silence is a tricky strategic move that can give you a lot of advantages when you're comfortable with it. Yeah, I think that's a good point, being comfortable with it, because quite often you'll just feel an urge to jump in and fill the silence Right, which is exactly what you want the other side to feel. Yeah. And once you master that, you've got a big advantage. And you also talk in the book and a lot about, or a lot in general, about the space between yes and no, or between no and yes. Right. Right. Yeah, you know, some people think that if there is no space between yes and no, that if somebody presses you for either a yes or a no, that you have to respond. They ask me if this is okay. Do I, I got to say yes or no? I mean, there's a grand canyon. There's, a, there's, a, there's an ocean of opportunity between yes and no. If you don't feel like you have to say yes or no, you can ask a question. You could clarify. You know, that it's yes or no, it's never yes only or no only. It's yes and. It's no and. So what, what goes with the and? Let's clarify. Let's find out what goes on in there. And to clarify is not is to neither accept nor reject. It's just to clarify. And as soon, as soon as you realize that clarification is okay and it's not offensive to clarify, a lot of people are afraid to clarify. As soon as, soon as you're okay to clarify the situation, then, then the amount of space between yes and no is huge. Yeah, and there's a great line in your book uh, that says... There is the visible negotiation and then all the things that are hidden under the surface, the secret negotiation space wherein the black swans dwell. <laughs> I love that line. It's, you know, it sounds like it's a monster from the depths coming up, right? <laughs> but it's a good monster. Yeah. I, that's yeah, my well, favorite line in the book. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's cool. Um, because, you know, there's no such thing as having all the information. I mean... Everybody out there, no matter what kind of a negotiation you're in, you're always going to be hiding stuff from the other side. You're always going to have hidden cards. Always. I can't. I've asked a lot of people, have you ever been in a negotiation when you weren't hiding cards? And I've never had anybody say, oh, yeah, I always lay all my cards on the table from the very beginning. Nobody says that. Well, so if that's true for you, it's true for them. So the next step here to try to think through, it's kind of like trying to think of what are the, you know, what are the, what's the inside of a Ruger's cube look like? 
Well, the reality is you don't know what the, your, how your hidden cards overlap with their hidden cards. And that's the space where great deals are. Because you, nobody knows the value of the, the hidden area overlap until you explore it. No matter how smart you are, there's always going to be a better deal if you can just – if you and they showed their cards, which is not going to happen until they trust you or you use a label or a mirror to unearth something. That, would, that gets back to exactly what you were talking about before. The mirror unearthed something that you didn't know was there and bang. Wow, there's a better deal here. And that that's how you're trying to find a black swan. It's like look again, like looking on the inside of a Rubik's cube. How do you do that? Yeah, let the other you get the other side's help. And that's what you that term is what you then use to name your business, is that right? That is absolutely yeah, right. You know, what are the little things that you could do in negotiation that'll uncover the little things that you could find out in a negotiation that'll change everything. A black swan is the impact of the highly improbable. So it's the metaphor is designed to cover both you as a negotiator and then what you're capable of in a negotiation. And you just mentioned something about um, a team and that's something that I wanted to ask you about because you mentioned in your book about having a team of people around you and some of them, their role is just to listen when you're having negotiations. What if you're a sole player, you don't have that team around you to, to help you listen in or just to listen? Well, and some of the skills are designed to buy you time within a negotiation so that you get a better chance to listen. I mean, the mirror, the label, the summary, the paraphrase, I mean, that's all designed to sort of go back over portions of the negotiation to bring you more information without the other side feeling like you're covering old ground. Um, you, you're going to hear something two, two times, maybe three times. It's not going to feel repetitive, but you're going to uncover layers all the time. When you make a pass over something, you sense there's something underneath it. All this really is designed to make you more effective as well if you're by yourself. You know, how, how, do I, how do I hear more? You label it, you mirror it. And that gets you out of the whole questioning thing too, which actually uncovers more information. Okay. And how about, I'm going to get into some more specific examples here, which relate to property developers. How about negotiating with politicians so I'll give you an example. I was recently trying to negotiate with a local councillor to support a proposal that we were putting forward for a type of deal. The local residents were dead set against it. So he was against it and I was unable to convince him to support us. So in that situation, he kind of has, doesn't have anything to lose because he's not getting anything by supporting me. Yeah, well, the, and, and you're driving at what's the heart of the matter uh, of any issue. What do people have to lose? What do, they actually, what do they actually have to lose versus what do they think they have to lose? So you're talking about people who are more driven about the prospect of loss, you know, a.k.a. prospect theory. So that gives you a good idea of what this politician's think about. Politicians thinking about their constituency's reaction first. So constituencies, not support of, of what you're going for. Somebody's gotten them to imagine a different future. And most people, they look at their perception of what's lost here, which is rarely accurate. You know, if, you, if you're trying to bring a real estate development forward, you're trying to bring for better housing conditions for everybody, better tax base, basically a better way of life. And sometimes people, what they think was, well, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the benefit of what happens here. So I'd rather deny other people because I'm not going to get it. And and they and they've got a different view of the future. Um, so the the issue really becomes how do people see the future and what do they perceive the loss to be? I know I know it sounds complicated, but what you really have to do is use empathy to get them to feel like they're being heard. You see me as a bad guy. Maybe, maybe in this, maybe in this interaction, 
the empathic statement would be for you to say to them, you see me as an intruder. You see me as somebody who's trying to disrupt your life. You see me as some greedy developer who doesn't care about anybody locally. I'm just trying to make a profit. Now, that by definition would have been an empathy statement because you actually didn't agree to any of it, but you did articulate it. And that's what empathy does. It, it takes the wind out of the other person's sails, so to speak, and it takes the steam out of their argument by articulating it first. And, and you're never going to get them to listen until you can say it from their perspective. So if that's their perspective, as soon as you articulate it, you show yourself as someone who's fearless and actually trustworthy instead of making it worse. So when you articulate it, then you, then you put yourself in a position of saying some of the effect of, what will happen if we don't do this? Well, what will happen is there won't be any development. There won't be new houses for anybody. There won't be a better tax base for anybody. But you use empathy to do what's called a focus comparison, which is, all right, so here's your perspective. You see me as a greedy developer, a greedy intruder, an outsider who doesn't care about the community. You know, what's going to happen if you keep me out? What's going to happen if, we, if no one develops this land? Now that gets them to look at the future in a different way. And they feel, because you asked a what question, as opposed to saying, don't you see, if we don't do this, nothing will get built, be built and everyone will lose. That's the point you're trying to make, but you can't make it by stating it. So what you do is you sort of clear their head with some empathy. And then you ask that killer calibrated question, which they don't feel backed into the corner, but you've really, you've focused and framed their vision on a specific thing that you want them to see. And that's what the water how question is designed to do. And is that the same sort of framework that you would use in a hostile group situation where you, say, had a community meeting where you were floating these ideas? Yeah, I would, I would, I would start out with the, the empathy statements. I mean, here's how you see this. You know, you, you see me as an intruder. You see me as not vested in your community. You see me as an outsider. I mean, we actually like to overstate this because... This, this approach of, of uh, diffusing the negatives, the labeling it diffuses them or even inoculates you from them. You know, denying them is a whole different dynamic. I don't want you to think I'm an outsider. I don't want you to think, you know, I'm a heartless developer. As soon as you start denying stuff, then nobody denies something that they're, that they're uh, fearless about. It must be true. So denying the negatives plants them. Labeling them not only diffuses them, but actually inoculates you from further accusations, which is why we call it an accusations audit, because it, it gets rid of this stuff. And you have to understand that two millimeters shift. And that's why we use empathy as a precursor to assertion, because what I want to do is, what's important to the community? What path do you want? How do you want to build a better life for your children? I mean, there's a killer one. Now you, you're talking about the future, you're talking about future prosperity. How do you want to have a better life for your children? How, how, what kind of environment do you want your kids to grow up in? Where are we going to be if nothing's built here? You know, these are, these are questions that are designed to focus people on the future and the reality of inaction. And that's when now you start to trigger status quo and people go out of their way to avoid the losses of the future, the losses caused by inaction. And then what about if that still doesn't work? Well, then the, then the deal isn't going to happen. So you've still got more work to do around convincing them. Yeah, or, you know, I mean, at some point in time, you know, there's an issue. Um, there's an old saying, there's some lids that are screwed on so tight nobody can get them off. Um, you know, so you either can't or don't want to make every single deal. What you want to do is engage in a negotiation to understand either, you know, how far from grasp is the deal? And are, is, there, is my time more well spent someplace else? Now, some of it might just be that, you know, this deal is going to take a lot of effort to make it. And if you understand how far, you know, how far that bridge is, and then you can make up your mind and you, you can make a cost-benefit analysis. Do I stay here 
or do I move on to a better deal? You know, I, I had a, a student that I was uh, coaching in a negotiation, a job negotiation, and she did everything right. And they wouldn't give her a fair offer. They wanted to continue to hire her at, as an intern, but have her function as a full-time employee. And the only way for them to understand how stupid that was is for her to move on and go someplace else. And sometimes you need people to live with the consequences. Leave them, leave them positively. You know, the last impression is the last impression. Your, your question may now be, what do I do now that this didn't work out? How do I set myself up for the next interaction? I have to finish with, with respect and appreciation for the other side. Because if they ever come to their senses, I don't want them to still be mad at me as to how we left off. Because the last impression is a lasting impression. So the very last move you should make in any negotiation, especially if the deal's not there, instead of walking out in a huff or slamming your hands on the table, the last impression is you want to you wanna leave people with is, hey, I, I treated you with respect. It just didn't work out. Um, and then if it's ever going to come back around, it will because you left them with a good positive last impression. Yeah, I think that's a good point. You don't want to blow your stack and leave a bad taste in everybody's mouth. Exactly. And then you set yourself up for the best possible opportunity of bringing it around if round two ever comes back. Yeah, and I've seen that so many times happen in my own life where something doesn't go quite right, but you sort of leave on reasonable terms and or it crosses your mind to just let rip with what you're actually thinking, but you hold back. And then sure enough, a couple of years later, something sort of comes around where you're dealing with that person again. Yep. The last impression is the lasting impression. You want to you wanna take advantage of every opportunity you can. So, um, Chris, property developers will often have to deal with real estate agents who act as intermediaries between vendors, and quite often you're not really sure whether they're passing on your information or you don't know whether you're negotiating with them or with the, um, the actual owner of the property. Could you give us some tips on how to deal with a situation like that? Yeah, you're always, you're always working through other people, and, and all, the, all the tools are the same. You, you're going to want to ask a lot of what and how questions. A good what you know what's going to happen if this doesn't go through. Now, uh, some of the what and how questions are designed not just so the person that you're asking gives you an answer, but so that they think about the question and actually repeat the question to the other side because you asked them five times, and at some point in time they're going to say to the the people they're representing or people on the other side, "Hey, I keep getting asked this question. This is my this is what I've said. Am I on the right track?" Those are the dynamics you're trying to trigger. You're trying to influence the conversations away from the table. Also, the use of empathy to get people to drop their guard and say things from their pers- you say things from their perspective. You show that you understand. This again increases that the interactions that you want to have happen on the other side, away from the table, will happen. Understand how the other side sees it. Articulate it. You might not like it, and in middlemen, people see you as a threat. What do they see as the loss? What are they most worried about? They're most worried about how much time goes into the deal. They feel very, very time pressured. They're very scared of losing deals. They're scared of a lot of things. Take into account what they're afraid of and then use empathy to articulate it. And then ask your open-ended question, the what or how question, the calibrated question is designed to get repeated to the other side. That's how you gain influence across the board. All right, well, let's switch gears a little bit, Chris. Just, I like to ask people that are on the show some different questions. So what's the toughest business decision you've ever had to make? Um, I have not. <laughs> you know, uh, I love what I'm doing. Um, so to me, tough is like a, a relative term. Um, you know, I, I get first world problems. The, uh, so, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm hemming and hawing. I don't know if I've had any tough decisions. 
you don't know that you've had any tough decisions? Uh, nice mirror, very, very nicely done. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I'm not. I'm not sure that I had. I mean, um, it's all. It, you know, it's it's evaluation. Uh, yeah. I mean, I just uh, they, they, so far, I guess I'm blessed. You know, I haven't, I haven't seen anything that's been that bad. Okay. Uh, well, I didn't mean bad. It's just tough. I know I've spoken to people who've had to part ways with a business partner or they've had to sack a major client or let people go. They're just, they're seems- I've, you know, I've been very lucky. Where, you know, those, those, those might come. I mean, I definitely feel responsible for, for everybody I brought in. And, uh, you know, I'm keeping the team together so far. And I, we, I haven't had to make any of those decisions yet. Well, I guess you've got a fairly unique um, view and thoughts about the world after dealing with life and death situations. I guess business situations are at a, a different level. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's, nobody's shooting me. And now, uh, if you could sit down for dinner with any three people, alive or dead, who would they be and why? All right. Uh, Jesus, Einstein, and a prophet Muhammad. <laughs> How do you like that? Yeah, that'd be uh, be an interesting conversation. Yeah, um, and why? You know, I you know I I the the, the world's religions, um, you know the, the 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 two strongest figures in either of those two religions. I see the I see them as both being very practical and very spiritual, dialed into who human beings are and how they're motivated. And you know, a lot a lot of the religious rules, whether they be for Christians or for Muslims, are very practical stuff. You know, and almost short uh, shorthand books for psychology. You know, I mean, the, the idea that you should forgive someone uh, being a spiritual thing to do in Christianity. So it's also a very practical thing to do. You're going to hold yourself back if you don't forgive people. You, you know, you carry negative thoughts around in your head. It's just a smart, practical thing to do. And there, there are a lot of rules in the religions that are for that. Prophet Muhammad, um, who I have not studied in great depth, but I, I'm, I'm aware of to some degree. I mean, he was, a, he was a great tactical, spiritual, emotional, practical leader. And he, he created... Uh, change in the Middle East. It was phenomenal. And, you know, and I would imagine, I imagine to be him to being a, a, an incredibly insightful human being that I would love to, to have uh, his thought, you know, I would love to hear firsthand what his, what his thoughts were. Einstein, same kind of guy. I, Einstein, who I just recently started reading about, you know, was a playful, irreverent guy who graduated last in his class in college, couldn't get a job out of college. Um, you know, and it was a smart aleck. That was one of the reasons why he couldn't get a job out of college. It was last year's class, and all his professors thought of him as a smart aleck. He was, yeah, half the time he didn't go to class because he thought his professors were dopes. And when he did go to class, he treated them like he thought they were dopes. So, you know, he was an interesting, fun-loving guy that did some crazy stuff. And somehow, with this attitude, um, discovered and figured some stuff out that no other people did. So, you know, I, I... I, th- I think in conversations with any any of those people would be tremendously interesting if you could say, like, come on, what were you really thinking? I mean, it, you know, I know why you said you did this, but why would you really do it? <laughs> yeah, I read uh, Walter Isaacson's uh, biography of Einstein, and it was fascinating. All right, and then one last question. Do you still drive your red Toyota 4Runner? It's not red. It's also red pearl. Let's get the color <laughs> right. Red. That sounds boring. It could be any color. Red. It's also red pearl. And yes, I do. I love that. Thing. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a good story in your book about how you uh, bought that car for a good deal. Yep. Used a lot of empathy. Empathized the heck out of that salesman. <laughs> pounded him with empathy and got a great deal. <laughs> Yeah, Beat so, him into submission with empathy. Yeah, so for, for people out there, the, your book can help you buy cars, buy houses, get a better job, negotiate salaries, covers everything. Yes, it does. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and I wanted, I wanted to ask you whether you see everything as a negotiation, like in your day-to-day life, are you sort of always haggling or 
Do you let things go? How do you deal with that? Well, yeah. All right. So a whole bunch of definitions there. Like I don't think of myself as a haggler. Now, haggling and negotiation are two different things. To me, negotiation is great collaboration. You know, mutual problem solving. You negotiate with somebody because the two of you are both faced with the same problem. You just got different angles on it. And I, and I view as part of negotiation, better collaboration, better relationships. So if that's your definition, it's mine, then yeah, I'm negotiating all the time. Haggling is just, I, I mean, I don't even like the sound of that word. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like win-lose. It's annoying. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not a word that has great feel to it, a great residue to it. So, you know, uh, I'm not a big fan of haggling. I'll, I'll do it occasionally. Um, but I don't find great collaborations come from haggling. Okay, that's good to know. All right, well, where can people find out more about you, Chris, if they're interested? You know, go to the blackswanltd.com, www.blackswanltd.com. Go there and sign up for our newsletter. It's the, uh, once a week, it's the edge, it comes out. Uh, and it's a key to good negotiation advice in short, small, di- digestible articles. Tells you about training we're doing all over the world. Tells you about other products we have. We got free stuff that we give away. The newsletter's free. You know, can it help you find the best price on the book. Um, the newsletter is really is really the key to everything that we do to help people get better. To, to you know to to move their entire life, to move their families into better places, to live in better houses. Yes, I've signed up for that and it is very good. So I'd encourage people to do that too. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad. Well, Happy to hear it. Chris, I'm very grateful to you for coming on the Property Developer Podcast and sharing your negotiating tips with us. It has been my, my pleasure, my privilege. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming on and we'll speak to you soon. All right. Thanks. Okay, there you go. An amazing discussion around negotiation. I hope you picked up lots of tips to help you negotiate your next deal. If you like that discussion with Chris and you think you want to get better at negotiating, which has to be a key skill for a serious developer, then email me about the training program that Chris and I are working on. I can be reached on justin at propertydeveloperpodcast.com Doesn't matter where in the world you are, as it will be delivered online. So drop me a line and get ready to be more confident when you start your next big negotiation. There were so many great points that Chris made, but here are three things that I learned from speaking with Chris and reading his book. 1. Have a plan before you start your next big negotiation. Over the past few weeks, I've been doing some preparation before I begin a negotiation. So I figure out what the outcome is I want, the key questions I want to ask, and some tips on things to be conscious of to do, like mirroring and labelling. And I found it to be very effective. Having a plan of what you want to achieve and a simple map of getting there will surely lead to better outcomes more often. In the back of Chris's book, he provides a framework for mapping out your negotiation discussions. That alone is worth the price of the book. Two, don't be afraid of no. I have to admit that before I read Chris's book that I tried to avoid no's, but now I can see they can be very powerful and that there is a big space between no and yes. No provides security and cover for people. And if you know that, you can begin to work from there. Getting a no actually helps to provide some boundaries and guidelines for how to progress the discussion. So don't be afraid of no. Three, try some of the techniques. I really recommend you buy the book and practice the techniques that Chris points out. Some of them, like asking people if they've given up, seem counterintuitive, but they do work. And you can try them out on smaller scale negotiations, like I did when buying some new dining chairs. I really think you are doing yourself a disservice if you don't buy Chris's book, as your competitors and counterparts will, and they will be in the driver's seat on the next negotiation. Okay, I really hope you enjoyed this episode of the show. I certainly loved bringing it to you. Don't forget, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook by searching for Property Developer Podcast. Thanks again for listening in, and until next time, may your next negotiation deliver a killer outcome for you. 
You've been listening to the Property Developer Podcast. Tune in next time for more tips, ideas and inspiration to take your developing to the next level. For more developing love, make sure to visit propertydeveloperpodcast.com.